Yeah, okay. we can hear you, Terry. So this has been a, a really uh, full meeting and we're still got lots to go because there's still a really a whole bunch of really, really nice plants on the show table. Now, as John mentioned before, um, you know, that uh, some people, when they send in their slides, they also send us a whole encyclopedia of information about that plant. And really, to be fair to everybody, we can't use that, uh, that uh, encyclopedia on the show table. But as John said, we do have a Facebook page and there you're, you can put as much on as, as you like and share all the, uh, all the stuff that you wanna share about your plant. So when we do the show table, it just goes really fast and, uh, and everybody gets to, to, to partake at the, at the same time. So let's get started. Okay, first of all, we have the Catley Alliance. Um, the the first one is Anna Cogan's uh, first flowering of a uh, just a minute I need to get rid of this because it's not needed a uh, Walkeriana which uh, which is supposed to be a cerulea form and she would have expected a a bluer a more blue in this uh, I think this is really nice the way it's growing in that in that coconut shell. Um, but because it is a small plant and it tends to wander and likes to have its roots out in the air, so this is a perfect way to grow it. But oftentimes with the ceruleas, they are, they are dependent on light and temperature. So on the next blooming, it could be much bluer because the conditions where it opens uh, would, be, um, would be different. Uh, imagine it's very nicely fragranced. So that's something that you can really enjoy. Uh, here we have the uh, Gor Goranthi skitteri, used to be the uh, uh, Cattleya, of course, and it's actually, uh, this is a very nice clone. David Bryan is, just has 36 flowers on, on four inflorescences, so that means it has uh, uh, nine flowers on each, on each head of flowers. That's really doing good, and look at the... Um, uh, the leaves on this, he's really growing this, this plant uh, with a lot of care. The only thing that would make this picture better was if we didn't have these Venetian blinds. A, 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 a clear background would make the, these things stand out even more. Really a beautiful thing. And we have another uh, Goranthi Skinneri. This is Heidi Jacobs. This is actually a Mariclone. Uh, the, the original plant received uh, an FCC and as uh, Albert says, they, they are huge flowers, uh, very full, and always a uh, reliable bloomer. Um, but it, it, and this is their blooming time for, for these things uh, every spring. Now, Joe DeChomo also has a Goranthi skin arrive, and this is the Forma Alba Debbie FCC. Now, he mentions that um, how the, the, uh, the, pe the uh, texture of it is sparkling in the sun. Uh, and he says that it's never been Mariclone. But the, the interesting thing about this, no, it hasn't been Mariclone, but it has been selfed. And the selfings have proved to be almost identical to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the plant. So even though there's no, no uh, Mariclone of, of Debbie, its progeny or its selfing is, has produced flowers that are just as good as the original. So that's really quite a neat. This I love this the colors in this Memoria Vita Lee Limelight AMAOS. It's Benosa with Brazilian treasure. Well, you know Benosa is has green, very similar. Well, uh, the sepals are are narrow like this, and they're it's starry, and they're green, and the the lip is white uh, white with with spots. Now, adding the uh, the Catley um, bicolor from the Brazilian treasure has brought in the color and maybe ch and changed the, the shape of the lip. But it's a, a really nice thing and I, I bet it's, it's also fragrant, especially in the evening. Now here we have some, a bit of an anomaly. This uh, uh, Rincolalia Catlea says, it came in as Catlea Cariad's mini queenie, uh, angel kiss. Now when, you, when a plant has a, a clonal name, it usually means that it's a Mariclone. So you expect all the plants of, of that Mariclone to look alike. Now, as we'll see in a minute, the actual uh, Cariad's mini queenie does not look like this. And um, it, the, if you look at the parentages involved in Mini Queenie, there is no, where, no place where you could get this kind of co uh, coloration. 
so uh, this is something that we have seen before and uh, we've looked at uh, some different spe some different hybrids. This uh, village chief or village chief north is something that it could possibly be. And I know that uh, Fiona says that it can't be, but you know, maybe you didn't mix up the lab labels, Fiona, but the person who sold you the plant probably did because this cannot be, because if you look, this is what what uh, Carrie Ed's mini queenie uh, angel looks like. And it's a mini purple with intermedia. And this mini purple is, is what gives it this shape. Uh, there is no way that this could change into the colors we have in, in that other plant. Now, this plant is really interesting uh, because Cydia actually grows this one with two-thirds of the, the roots submerged in, in water. Now, I bet that that plant grew those roots into that water itself. You can't just take a, a, a plant and put its roots in water and expect it to to um, survive because when the plant does it itself it uh, adapts the roots to grow in water and it works but if you try to put it, roots that were growing in air and put them in water they drowned this is a gorgeous thing um and so you can see the difference from from fiona's plant beautiful old-fashioned big white uh, Nancy Chase, it's been around for a very, very long time. It's probably very fragrant, huge flowers. The only problem I see with this plant is that the, the, it tends to be a bit floppy along the tops. And I see that it's getting lots of light, so that's not a problem. But I wonder if increasing the humidity would help to plump up those petals and the, the dorsal and make them stand up to really give that full look on, on the plant. Um, when uh, orchids actually, orchid flowers actually absorb water. So misting on, misting the flowers themselves on, you know, when it's sunny and, and warm probably helps to keep them a little bit more turgid and, and their presentation is a little bit better. But look at this, nine blooms on three stems and a beautiful, beautiful fragrance. This is Cattleya's or Orglades Grand. Now, this is a hybrid of two very famous parents, Mildred Rives by, by Persephilis. And they both, uh, both of the parents are very similar to this. So I'm not sure what they were looking for uh, when they made this cross, uh, unless it's just more of a really good thing. Uh, Sylvie Porter grew this. You can see six by six inches by six inches. That's a big flower, and I, and it also is probably uh, quite uh, um, as she says. These fragrance is like lilies, really beautiful. Even and it's just one flower. It still is a beautiful show. Uh, now this one kind of it took me back a little bit. Uh, Cattleya Plump Love, one of Joe DeChomo's plants. I looked at it and looked at it and there was something wrong. And then I started counting parts. One, two, three, four. Maybe there's a fifth here, but we all, one, two, three, four, five. Now we all know orchids are supposed to have six parts, three sepals, two petals, and a lip. And then I started looking over here. Look at these tips. What's happened here is this petal on that on this flower has uh, came out fused with the dorsal, and here it's this petal that is fused with the dorsal. So something happened when the buds were developing that it that the plant is is deformed. But this doesn't mean that it's going to be deformed every time. And I'm sure that Joe could tell us that probably most of the time it blooms and it looks uh, perfect. And in fact, the the third flower looks like it's fine too. But when you're missing a part, look to see where it's going. It's that's We don't see that very often. This is a beautiful uh, thing. Uh, Catlianthi naranga de flor, SVO. Now the color in this is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Parasar Das grew this. Uh, and he said that he got it as a seedling in, in just last August, that's just not even a year ago. It must have been a big seedling. Um, the one thing that I would recommend is when you're photographing your plants is uh, don't get, uh, 
don't photograph them in full sun or with the, sun, the light coming from the back because with the sun coming through, it really distorts the color and we can't really see the full, full set. Uh, light shade uh, or even stepping down your, your, your f-stop to give it will, will intensify the color. But try to avoid full sunlight to, uh, when you're photographing your plants. A beautiful Sakura candy, Kathleenanthi. Uh, it is Colette's uh, plant, a beautiful thing. Now this one, she had said to, had to um, nurse back from, uh, to health, so something happened. But she mentions a synthetic fragrance. Uh, I wonder what is, the, what is meant by that, but you can see the, the Walkeriana in, in the background with a wide open lip and the, the exposed uh, uh, thing there. The, Ananthelia, Twilight Magic. Uh, this is a, 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 an epi, uh, epidendron with, a, or sickly, I guess, with the, uh, um, with the Cattleya cross. And the, the encyclias all, always have a lot of flowers, but they tend to be sort of muted colors. So adding Cattleya in there, you, you get something that produces lots of flowers and a branched inflorescences and, um, and probably some fragrance too, but you get a lot more color. Uh, Sinia grows this in uh, outside and winters it in the south window with extra T5 lights. And beautiful pink flowers. Uh, and sickly is Xingfong uh, flag. Uh, it's a primary cross. And Fiona says that she loves the um, the the, uh, the round pseudobulbs that it has. I know that I'm not that familiar with the the one parrot but i know the kerjigera has these sort of egg-shaped uh pseudobulbs that you just want to stroke it's a really pretty thing another uh grand cyclia uh now this is uh goranthi orientiaca which is the orange cattleya or used to be a cattleya uh it's the orange goranthi with the incumbents which is a green uh and uh, cyclia and putting the two together, you get a very nice yellow flower. And again, this is, you can see, this is maybe the uh, uh, most can be a, a second uh, flowering on the seedling. And as this grows up, it'll produce a big uh, spike with lots of branches and, and uh, really, uh, really produce a, a, a spectacular uh, exhibition. Uh, Lila Catlea City Life, Duchomo Patricia, one of Joe's plants, Liptonia with Circle of Life, and you can see the Circle of Life adding that really nice fullness to, and to, and to the flowers uh, in quite nice flat, very pretty color, very nice. Uh, Lilia Catlea um, Coastal Rise, uh, Carriad's Dawn, HCC AOS. Now this is an Anceps cross with a Helen Velez. Helen Velez is a, uh, one of the uh, very old orange cattleyas. Uh, in the times, in previous times, in the olden days, it was hard to get a good uh, orange cattleya, but Helen uh, Velez was orange. And uh, crossing it with Anceps, you have the Anceps uh, shape, uh, which is usually sort of pinkish uh, lavender colors, but it, the the orange really really brings out the the sunrise uh, um, part of the uh, the color in in this plant. Um, it has two flowers and one bud on one inflorescence. And again, this can be can ha will in the future have more flowers than that. Um, Catlian, the chief sweet orange by Circle of Life. Again, you have the big petals. Again, it's hard to see the, the colors because of the light coming through the back of the flower. Try to have the light coming towards the front of the, from the front of the flower, you're, you're certainly gonna get a lot better uh, effect. But it's really nice that, that it blooms for such a long time. Uh, uh, Barasar says that they, it's been in bloom for a second bloom in two months. So that means it's getting new growth. So it's a, he's growing it well and uh, the plant is, is happy. Uh, Yvain uh, McLellan has this um, Catlianthi Fusheng Glory, Happy Holiday. It kind of looks like a, a, a holiday fireworks, doesn't it? With a pale yellow uh, 
uh, sepals and petals and that brilliant lip that is just gorgeous and obviously vigorous since it last bloomed in November. I think all these plants are really performing well because we're home to give them the, the care that they need. This is gorgeous. Uh, uh, Rinca, Rincatlanthi Singfong Little Sun. This is a, a really good plant to have. Uh, it, a lot of people grow it. It's easy to grow, easy to flower, and produces lots of nice flowers. You notice something here is that it looks like these flowers here uh, are quite different from the ones on, on either side. Uh, the ones in the middle are obviously the last ones to open. And you, as you can see, there's one that's uh, only partially open. It's always nice when the flowers open and they, ch and they, when they change color, they change color to a more intense color rather than bleaching out. Nicely done, beautifully presented. And look at that, there's nothing in the background. All we see is those beautiful flowers and a really well-grown plant. Uh, Wrinkle Lily Cat Leia Jennifer Off Joan um, uh, Harold Carlson by uh, Don DeMichaels, uh, one of da David Bryan's plant. This is a beautiful splash petal with a look at that lovely velvety lip. Uh, again, uh, nine flowers on four inflorescences. What a beautiful presentation! Uh, nicely done. These big. Catleys are, are so magnificent when they are in bloom. They do take room, but boy, are they nice when they bloom. This is an interesting little thing. It's called uh, Rinkolilia Little Circle Mini Pizzazz. And John Vermeer says it was named Mini Pizzazz because it looks like its grandpa, uh, Toshi Aoki Pizzazz. Well, what I remember of Toshi Aoki wasn't nearly as nice as this. I think the, the, the grandchild has far surpassed the, the, uh, the grandpa, but it certainly is a very pretty flower. This is an oldie too. It's uh, uh, Rincolalia Ports of Paradise, Emerald Isle. This is a, um, it was one of the first green uh, flowers, the totally green flowers that was, uh, that was bred, it had to be Oh, 35 years ago when it first came out and they, a, a little four inch pot uh, was a hundred dollars. And 35 years ago, that was a heck of a lot of money. Um, I think when this first opens up, it, it opens up quite green and is really quite fragrant, but then it, it, it goes to a yellow, which is still attractive, but it's no longer the green that it was bred for. Um, it has a citrus uh, scent and well done, Anna, it, very nice thing and uh, probably last quite well. Okay, now we're into the Vanda Alliance. Uh, this is uh, Kylocus the Lunifera. This is one of the ghost orchids. We all know about the ghost orchids that grows in the, in the um, Everglades, but this is also a ghost orchid because if you look, there's no leaves on it. This is one that we've tried to grow in, in, uh, in many times, many times, but uh, it doesn't do well for us. I guess we just don't pay enough attention to it. You notice it's just growing on a little piece of shade cloth. It doesn't even need uh, uh, like a, uh, an organic substrate to grow on. It just grows, but it requires uh, really a lot of humidity. It needs daily care. Uh, as, um, as Sydney has said, uh, it, she misses it every day and well, of course, when she got it, it only had four flowers. This time it has 18. Obviously, it's responding to, to the care that, that Sinia is giving it. Now, this is another little story, uh, a Philanopsis. It's, um, it came in with a tag uh, lobii, and Ivan recognized that this is not what he expected it to be because the lobii is flowers about the same size, but it's white with a with a purple or or brown on the lip, and so he recognized that this couldn't possibly be it, and he purchased it about three years ago, and he says that he had trouble blooming it because every time the spike came out, it would dry off. But this year, because he's home and misting it every day, it, the flowers actually open. So uh, 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 I agreed, uh, both Kathy and I agreed that this can't be lobii. So we uh, consulted an expert, Drew um, Goodart uh, from the RBG, grows a lot of species uh, Philanopsis and he's well uh, acquainted with them and actually does some nice breeding with them. So uh, we consulted with him 
and he reminded us this looks just like uh, Philonopsis chibe, and this is also the blooming time for chibe. Uh, Lobii actually blooms in the fall. So, so this is so part of a good thing about putting stuff on the show table. Not only do we everybody get to admire it, but you also sort of uh, sort of sort out names that don't seem to quite fit. Now, this is exactly what it's supposed to be. This cornicera you read, and when you look at it. Um, this is really interesting in inflorescence. Now, th there's only, it has one, this one doesn't have a flower on it, but what the nice thing about the, the cornicery is that these inflorescences flower for years and years and years. And as the uh, plant grows, and every year it puts out uh, one or two new, new flower spikes, and so eventually you can have a, quite a number of flowers open at the same time. These last well, they're shiny, shiny, and uh, they're just really a pretty thing. Uh, I like the way this was potted. Elena potted this, like you see most of uh, the, the best Neophonetius uh, uh, potted. I think that some plants really don't like the water to run in towards the, the um, the the bottom of like the, the 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 crown of the plant and so when you pot them like this where it's on top of a, a sort of a, a a hill then when you water the water runs off down the sides and then you don't get the water pooling at the crown at the base of the plant so maybe this is why this works so well and of course you all know that um that this is extremely fragrant beautiful thing again this is a, this is actually a clone so it's a particularly good one it may be the i'm not sure daruma uh it probably has something to do with the uh the um the plant itself uh because this is another one of those japanese uh and entities where they they grow just different forms of the same plant and and give them names, but this one is uh, actually very pretty. Uh, but the fragrance is just heavenly. Uh, Phalaenopsis schilleriana, another fragrant uh, uh, Phalaenopsis, and now not all of them are as fragrant have the same fragrance. Well, they have the, all the same fragrance that they have it, but some are more fragrant than others. Um, and the nice thing about these, not only does it have this this pretty uh, pink and white, but usually they're shades of pink, um, more or less, and it all they can have branched inflorescences, very long inflorescences with many branches on them. And the, the best thing I think is that they have these beautiful leaves that are mottled. And of course, when the plant is in a flower, then they also have uh, you have this these beautiful leaves to look at. Uh, and that's Yvonne's plant too. Uh, now, Elena grew this Stewardiana. Now this Stewardiana is not the regular Stewardiana. The, the regular Stewardiana is actually white and it, ha and it has all these spe this speckling on the bottom half of the flower. Um, this is, I think, I'm pretty sure this would be either the Phalaenopsis Stordiana um, variety Nobelor, or is a cross with Nobelor and the regular uh, Stordiana, because the Nobelors usually are, are, um, are all yellow, and of course, if the other one is is white, you could get this kind of thing. But it, it could be just straight noble lord, and it's just a different, a little different in color. But I must uh, congratulate you on growing this. I find this very difficult to grow, um, and even to flower. Uh, the buds come up, and they they get distorted, and I don't know what happens. They just seems to be more sensitive to outside influences that I get. So you're doing a really nice job on this particular Stewardiana. Now Fiona says she loves the the hap, hap hazardousness and sequ of this sequentially flowering uh, Phalaenopsis and the fact that each flower is different. Now I really think that Fiona has a, a really whimsical appreciation for the art of of orchid plants. And I'm you know when uh, orchids aren't always in bloom, this is a very important part of our our hobby. But what happens here is that what we're seeing here is that this plant, these flowers actually have the anthracyanin to give you this deep color. Uh, but so they has the genes for that, but these genes are, are actually uh, controlled by these, contr uh, these control genes and they turn the, the, the 
the color genes on and off. And obviously when you have a, a, a plant that has flowers that are, each one is different, it means that that control is probably a little bit flimsy. So sometimes it turns on and sometimes it doesn't. And so thus you get a, a variety of, of uh, flowers. And so you'll get all different kinds of flowers on one plant, which is not a bad deal too. Uh, this is another form uh, of uh, tetrapsis. It uh, has the name Imperatrix purple. Now you see that this is a different uh, color tone and I assume that the because of the purple, um, they, they, this is the color that, that was expected. Uh, I guess Andrew could tell us, but it was, um, but it's a more pinky color than, than the other tetrapsis that we looked at. And the, the, uh, flowers are more regular, but you still get some that are, 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 are different from the others. And this is okay because this is the, the nature of the beast. Now, this is Rancostylus gigantea. Now, when your plant is named gigantea, it is not usually because it has the gigantic flowers. Even this plant will get to be a giant. That's why it's called Giantia. However, the nice thing about the Rhynchostylus Giantia, it starts flowering out of quite a small plant, as you can see here, and it has a glorious, glorious uh, uh, scent. Uh, you notice it's growing in in um, in pellets, and and that's because this, like all Vandacious, the it really likes to have lots of air around this root so that the you don't get that compact thing happening that you get sometimes get if you grow in bark. So it's, um, uh, she's only had it for a year, obviously has lots of light and can enjoy it for many, many years before it gets too big for your spot. This is really interesting. This is an Arangus citrata with fastiosa. Now fastiosa is a little plant that's at uh, full size, is about uh, not quite three inches across with a two, two and a half inch flower. And then you have citrata that has a cascade of flowers. So crossing the two together, you get big flowers with nice long nectaries and, uh, and lots of them. Uh, this is a really happy cr uh, cross, well worth growing. Uh, one, again, Elena's plants. Now, this is uh, one of Colette's plants that she re rescued from the d dollar discount rack. I didn't know that the, the orchids went down to that <laughs> levels. But you know, you, uh, you might have noticed that when you rescue a plant and treat it well and bring it back to life, they really do perform for, uh, for you. It's like a stray uh, cats and dogs, you know, when you take a stray in and start treating them right, they get so grateful that they'll do anything for you. And that's the same with our orchids. Uh, this is so, uh, something that's uh, really nice, uh, nice to see. Uh, Juliet says that this has been in bloom since last August. And you can see, uh, this is a close-up of, uh, of the flowers, but you can see on the stem, there was a whole bunch that have already fallen off. So probably what happened was that when these uh, uh, flowers were all in, in bloom, uh, the plant got a little bit of a chill. Like Inga said, by putting it in, you know, uh, cooling down a phalaenopsis, it, it encourages it to make buds. So this already had a, a good strong stem. So it just went ahead and made some more um, buds. And so now she has this beautiful cascade. And she has a beautiful arrangement on these uh, flowers because she didn't turn the plant once the bud started of, uh, 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 developing. Uh, this is a, a special plant for Nick Cox because it was given to him uh, from as a retirement gift from a student. Uh, it's always nice to get when students uh, understand that that you have a hobby that's special. Uh, so it doesn't have a name, but it doesn't matter because it's such a pretty thing and nice, healthy plant, a beautiful lip on it. I love the, the it's almost it, this little flush in the center with little speckles, Pr very pretty thing. Uh, Phalaenopsis joey was a gigantea with, with Ludmaniana. Um, Ludmaniana is, uh, is actually um, uh, quite, uh, very similarly colored, but very soft, much softer colors. What the Gigantea has added is that really intensified the color and the substance in the in this uh, flower. I, Sylvie says that it's three three inches by three inches, um, and it has a light fragrance. But both the parents have a bit of a fragrance. 
but the fact that you, the gigantea adds, adds real substance to the flower, so it's probably very, very thick and will last a very, very long time. Uh, Phalaenopsis montrose, one of, another one of Colette's plants, beautiful color, and of course this is the uh, quite an unusual shade of the sepals and petals. It's almost con color in that the lip and the petals and the sepals, everything is all one color, and then it has that little white dot uh, on the anther cap, and, and which really sort of brings the, the whole thing together. Really a very, very pretty plant. Uh, Penang violacea variety alba, violacea by Michalitsiewicz. Now, uh, one of Sinia's plants that winters under two LED lights. This is another one of the, of course, the violacea, both the violacea and the uh, Michalitsiewicz uh, don't have a lot of flowers on a stem. They have one or two. And obviously, uh, when you have a whole bunch of uh, inflorescences, like I see one, two, three, least four or five, then you have a big bunch of flowers that, that are really pretty. Uh, the, obviously, the, uh, the alba forms of the violacea were used because the Mitsurutsia is, is a sort of a yellowy orange shaped uh, violacea type flower. So, so now you've got just the, the yellow tips on there and it's very, very attractive. Uh, Phalaenopsis Ron, uh, Ronnie Glamour mauve, petite snow with with Su, Su Chang balm, one of Duchomo's plants. Uh, this is a, a mauve vari variety, and he says that this is very fragrant. Um, this is what we call the the uh, multi um, the, the multi uh, Phalaenopsis because they have the small flowers and they branch. So you can see this one, and the ra the and the reason that Joe brings the uh, the attention to the color is because most of them more, look more like this. Um, so that it, it he says that it is actually uh, orange that that sort of turns uh, that sort of turns to yellow in the in the background. And here again, if th there was less light on on these plants. Uh, on these flowers, we could see the the uh, the color better and and the and it would actually stand out more. But very well flowered, um, it's the multifloral form. You can see the all the the branches. Uh, the the problem with the multiflorals, they don't produce the the huge beautiful cascades that the bigger ones do. But uh, but when you see that many flowers and in a great big bunch, it still is very very attractive and fragrant. Uh, Sinia's uh, Sogo Popcorn, Sinia, H-C-C-A-O-S, obviously one of her awards. Uh, beautiful uh, uh, winters under two LEDs. Um, again, is one of the multiflores, but see how beautifully flat. Now, see, when they don't have as many branches, they can arrange them beautifully, and then we get to see them with each individual flower a little bit more. Now, Phalaenopsis yin yang jian uh, cherry red turtle. It does look like a tur like the back of the turtle, doesn't it? Except th that it's a colored turtle. So Leslie s he mentions that it is 75% gigantea. Now, uh, remember what I said about uh, gi the name gigantea on a species? You can see that this is flowering for the first time, and look at the size. Um, of the leaf, but these flowers are gorgeous. They have, the gigante has a very full flower, and uh, they're, as I said, very thick. So this w makes it um, uh, a really long-lasting, beautiful flower, and uh, also very fragrant. But I have seen gigante uh, as big as a meter across. So it, this will probably grow uh, quite a bit still. Now we actually have a Vanda, Dr. Anik by uh, number two, Fuchs Delight by uh, Pompano. Uh, Albert St. Pierre grew this. It's got beautiful color, large plants, and it'll, it flowers uh, more than uh, once a year. And, and that happens with Vandas. They will flower uh, on and off throughout the year as long as they're getting um, lots of light uh, and lots of uh, water. Uh, and not too much nitrogen. If you feed Vanda's nitrogen, they won't flower. They'll just put out leaves. Okay, now back uh, now to the slippers. Okay, this is number one, and I can see this is pa uh, Paphiopetalum hanyanum, first class Charlie. This is one of Leslie's plants. Uh, 
the I bet he doesn't say how big the, this this is, but I bet they're they're close to six inches across. These are huge flowers, beautiful um, beautiful butterly yellow. Um, it's a and and fragrant one of the fragrant paths. Uh, Paph, uh, Paphia wardii monster. Uh, this is one, another one of Leslie's plants. He has all, always has these variations on on the species, which makes it really interesting to see so, sort of things that that are out of the ordinary. This is a very large flower. Um, they can be dark, the darker in terms of the the pouch and and even the intensity and and the the number of spots on them, but. For size, boy, that's really big. And notice the beautiful moth of leaves. Again, uh, you know, you have to realize that plants aren't, the orchids aren't in flower all the time. So having, having beautiful leaves is a real bonus. This is something uh, we haven't seen in a very long time. It's a, a Paphiopetalum uh, transval with Ranzii. Now, Ranzii is is very seldom grown, and uh, transval is a is a another multifloral. Uh, but you can see how beautifully uh, grown this is. Linda likes the green color and the stripes. Yeah, the green is really nice because oftentimes you have sort of a, a tan or a light yellow, but the green really uh, sort of uh, uh, pops the, the, the stripes and makes it look really nice. And look at the shoulders on that thing. It it's really presents itself. It has lots of presence. Uh, and it's excitingly wood, one of David's uh, plants. Uh, now it has beautiful color. It has nice rosy sort of uh, flush on the tips. I love the pouch. It's almost solid. Well, it's not. I wouldn't call it burgundy. I guess it's a deep, deep rose. Beautifully, beautifully striped. Uh, nice, clean flower. Uh, again, because it's a Maori eye type, it has the beautiful leaves and. Uh, uh, yes, David, I agree. Too bad there's no judging. It, it would probably have been on the table yesterday. Uh, Linda Will grew, grew this, uh, what we call a toady path, Hong Shang Cruet. Um, and it's, uh, she says that it looks yellow here, but it's actually green. And I, yeah, sometimes the colors are hard to, to, um, to, to pick up uh, with, the, with the camera, but sometimes lowering the amount of light, like uh, lowering the f-stop, uh, will help with getting the green, because you can see that even the leaves are are looking uh, probably more yellow than than they should be. Oh, or are they variegated? It almost looks like they're variegated. But the beautiful green uh, uh, flower that probably lasts for a long, long time. Uh, Fragmentpedium Eculo Eculo. This is Peruflora circa. Cirilla with uh, Alka and Del by Del Zandroy. Now this is interesting because this is a, a second generation Cavachii cross. The the Circa uh, Cirilla Alaka is uh, as actually a uh, Cavachii cross. Um, he, and Ed Cott says he's really impressed with intense salmon color. And the, and the nice thing too is that with because of the Delisandro, it's tending to hold two flowers, which is really great. Now Ed grows uh, these his frags in an ebb and flow tank, and hopefully he'll be around and he can tell us a little bit more about it later on. Uh, Fragmopedium Hanapapoff. This is a great uh, frag for for people starting out in frags. Very very consistent, very easy to grow. Consistent fl uh, flower, and because it's sequential, it'll flower over a long period of time. Um, it varies in color. This this Linda says that she likes this one because it's a nice dark pink color. But they can be uh, have a lot more yellow. They can be lighter pink. They can be uh, actually bicolor, where half the petal is is yellow and half the uh, petal is is pink so this is a this is a nice plant to have and it's not too big so it doesn't take up a lot of real estate another one that's easy to grow is the olaf gross bestiae with piercei any of the bestiae is crossed with any of the longifolium group of of uh of um uh, frags are fairly easy to grow they flower easily and most of them are are uh, quite quite a good, you know, reasonable in size. This is the Vans plant. It, you can see it has three spikes. There's one in flower. You see one there, and there's 
probably one coming up someplace else. But it's but it's grown in clay pellets. Frags do do well in clay pellets, but then you have to be careful about the watering and make sure that uh, that the water doesn't uh, dry out too much and that you flush flush those pellets from time to time because they will they will accumulate some um, salts. Okay, the Oncidium Alliance. Uh, we start off with a tag that says Oncidium ampliatus. Well, the only Oncidium, ampli ampli Oncidium that's close to that name that, that I know of or was able to find was Oncidium ampliatum. And Oncidium ampliatum is, um, is actually a muleared uh, uh, Oncidium and it's all yellow. Um, and this is not a Mueller, this is a regular type Oncidium. Um, th the nice thing is that flowers after everything else is finished, so, so they get to, in, uh, to Milton and, and Connie get to enjoy it then. But if you take a look, this is uh, the Oncidium ampliatum is now called the Rossioglossum, uh, and this is what it looks like. Ingham Peter grew this particular one, um, and it, uh, um, and she says it's very floriferous. Look at the number of, of inflorescences and see, see the shape of the flower and it's pure yellow. It's brilliant yellow, just like sunshine. It's glorious. Now, Inga says that they grow it on north facing veranda with uh, a heated floor. Obviously, it likes the heat on, on its toes because we've never really been able to grow this very well. And it is one of the oncidiums that I think is, is really beautiful. Another uh, uh, something that, see now that one was taken, an oncidium that became a rossia glossum. This was an oncidium luridum that became a trichocentrum. So the the taxonomists had their fun with all these oncidiums. And this is Cinea's brown bee, HCC AOS. And this is actually a, 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 a different form of it. And when it was awarded, uh, I know that we had to have it identified because it really didn't look quite like lur luridum but the STIF came back and said, yes, it's luridum. It's a very nice form of it. It's just a little different coloring. And you notice that it has 158 flowers on an almost two meter uh, inflorescence. So you can see that this would be why they would use something like uh, this species to increase the flower count when they're doing oncidium breeding. Uh, see, here we go again. The, Sylvia Porter took, the, uh, took um, a single back bulb and grew it for a year and a half. And here is this Brassia Rex rewarding her with this lovely inflorescence. But you know, uh, orchids do take patience, but when you give them that patience, they do reward you. Pig, Brasidium Pagan Love Song. Now this used to be a McClellan era. And Sue Loftus grew, uh, grows this uh, outside in the summer and under lights in the winter, just blooming it for the first time. Um, and probably uh, it's qu got quite a long inflorescence. She doesn't say how long it is, but we were in, at a show in San Francisco with when one of these got an FCC. The pseudobulb on that, that plant um, actually had, the, was, uh, about twice, about almost twice as big as a grapefruit, and that's the the, the pre premier grapefruit, not the little tiny ones that you get, you know, that that you get on sale. Um, so Sue, keep growing. When that pseudobulb gets really big, you're going to have a seven foot inflorescence with with probably 40, 50, 60 flowers. Well, um, something to look forward to. It's nice to see some Miltoniopsis. This is one of Linda Will's uh, flowers, and she says that uh, its fragrance is most intense at first thing in the morning when the, the sun hits it. And you know that uh, flowers don't usually, or very often, don't uh, aren't fragrant all the time. They're fragrant at certain certain times, uh, and it's because they they send out their fragrance to attract their pollinators when they know the pollinator is going to be around. Very, very delicate colors, beautiful uh, flowers. This uh, uh, I'm glad to see, Hanajima Ono, Maui Falls, beautiful waterfall. Um, uh, Andrew did a great job with these. Look at all the flowers uh, on this. Um, you notice the leaves are really quite uh, light green, 
Miltoniopsis aren't high light plants, but their leaves are always a light green uh, because that's, that's the nature of the beast. That's just the, the way they grow in nature. Another, and a third uh, Miltoniopsis, Limelight Imogene Smith, grown by Steve, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's one that's been around for quite a while. Now, this one actually does respond to temperature at which, they, uh, at which the flowers open. Oftentimes, if you have a big plant with lots of flowers on them, you'll have flowers with different amounts of white around the rim of the, of the, uh, the lip because the amount of uh, red in the lip seems to really depend on the temperature at which the, the flowers open. Uh, but very nicely done. Uh, obviously a happy plant. I'm glad to see that people still have some, uh, some of the Miltoniopsis. They're hard to find these days. Now here's one's called uh, Space Race Coco. Uh, it's Spatiante by Bouquet of Sunset. Uh, it's probably very uh, fragrant. And um, the uh, Joe Chomo says this has uh, four spikes, and we can see four spikes. But Joe, this could have been the plant of the month. However, look at what you've got here. The only thing that's in, 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 uh, in focus are these pots in the front. You have a beautiful plant. This plant is trying to please you. It wants to do so much for you. You need a bigger background because the flowers come over, you know, uh, don't fit on the background that you have. Use a wall, use a sheet, but give your, your plant the full, it's full due because if these, these flowers had been in, in focus, it would have been plant of the month easily. So, you know, give your plant a, a go chance and, and check, to, uh, check for a focus before you send the thing out because with uh, digitals, it's easy to do that. It's not like when we used to have to do it with, with film and wait for it to come back while it's developed and then, um, you know, then, then take it again. Now, this I think is gorgeous. Uh, this is Telumnia di Chomo Giuseppe, uh, a, a cross that, that Joe named. Um, and uh, this is very different from most of the telumnias that, that we see. Most of them are spotted or speckled or, you know, blotched or whatever. I love the soft, you know, very even color, uh, well worth growing. And with a few more flowers, it definitely needs to come to judging. Uh, uh, Zalemnia midas, uh, Sinia. Uh, this is one that, that Sinia got, got awarded. Now, this is a, a Zalemnia because it's, it's crossed with Zelenkoa, Onusta. Uh, now, Zelenkoa used to be on Sidium too, but it has much wider petals. It's hard to see because of the focus here, but the petals, usually on a Tolumnia, the petals are very small, but this, uh, the Zelenkoa has big, wide petals, so it sort of fills in the flower, so you get a more massive head of flowers. A very nice thing, and this seems to uh, do, this is fairly easy to grow, and very rewarding um, presentation. Now we have the Dendrobium Alliance, which of course, as we've learned, uh, includes our bul bulbophyllums. Uh, this is a great picture, the Rauschtaldeanum red chimney, FCC AOS. Uh, the red chimney, uh, it got an, uh, an FCC because it's a very, it's, it was a very large flower for the, Rosh, uh, for the Roth, for Rauschtaldeanum. And it actually uh, was awarded many, many years ago. And I'm not sure, it may have been Maricloned, but it's such a good grower that probably it's been, it, it's been around the world twice just from divisions. But notice that the, the really interesting thing with the bulbophyllums is that they have all these hairs to attract the flies that pollinate them. Because you know, bulbophyllums often have a scent that's not pleasant to us humans. And of course the lip, uh, this gorgeous, look at the color of the lip. Um, and this is hinged, so it bobs up and down too. So this is what, it, what it's trying to do is to attract some flies. Uh, this is then Dendrobium bracteosum. Uh, Penang Jang grew this in a window uh, on the edge of his kitchen sink. So I'd be afraid that I'd be uh, knocking it into the sink when I was doing the dishes, but this is great. Um, it's quite interesting that um, 
that it has this very uh, dark lip because that's unusual for, for, this, for this particular species, but it makes a, for a really nice bunch of flowers. And these flowers will last for months and months and months. And from that, we go to farmeri, dendrobium farmeri that Albert grew, and he'll tell you that this is not that last all that long. In fact, I've seen plants that come in pristine to a show on Friday and by Sunday, they're, they're starting to fold. And now uh, this is one that does need the, uh, um, the, the cold rest over the winter. And th doesn't the lip look like an egg yolk? Beautifully done. Another one that uh, Zuloftus grows and gets, and again needs uh, no water and dry over the winter. Um, Sue does so well with these ones that need a rest in, in winter. Obviously she has other things to do in winter, so her plants just sort of sit there. Uh, but this is Fimbriatum, a beautiful yellow color, and the, the eye, that dark eye really sets the, the flower off. Nicely done. Uh, um, now, Sue says she doesn't like the scent of this. And you know, scent is uh, perceived differently by different people. Somebody else might like it, but certainly this one um, is doing well. And I like the way you photograph this by hanging this plant up uh, against a background that's, that's quite um, uh, uh, neutral. We get to see the, the sort of the architectural shape of the plant. Nicely done, Sue. Uh, another one that needs a, a, a winter rest, Elena uh, grew this one, the Lindleyi. Uh, again, you can see that it has very hard leaves. Um, the uh, plant actually does need the cool coolness in the uh, in the winter time, but then when it starts to grow, it produces these sunshine flowers that are just gorgeous. I, I, I see uh, things coming through and I'm going to have to read them, but I can't read them fast enough to, to answer them. Sorry. Now, this is Dendrobium moliniforme, is uh, something that uh, uh, Colette grew. Now, she says she grows it in her cool basement. Now, this is a part of the nobly type uh, dendrobiums. Uh, a group, uh, the nobly typed dendrobium, um, and they re uh, they do grow cool, but they don't require quite a, a as much of a rest as the actual nobly and and some of the other ones that we looked at. Um, and I would say that this particular clone is really really nice. Um, my assignment was dendrobiums uh, for the WOC, and the moliformes flowers that I saw. Uh, I, there's a, this would stack up against them very well and, and better than a lot of them. This is a really nice flower. Uh, a nobly hybrid, uh, Parasar says he purchased a res another rescue plant. Isn't it great that in, uh, people are rescuing um, uh, orchids and then they, they, they bloom for you? Uh, you can see here the, the the nobly types do tend to make kikis, so baby plants. So they're a good plant to have around. So when somebody, when you want to give somebody a gift, you can just take off a, a kiki, they pot it up and they, they have a, a, a new orchid. But again, the, that rest in the winter time is really, really important. This is one that has a bit of a rest, but not nearly as much as the nobly types. This is Pixie Charm. Uh, and this is a 4N clone, so it actually grows a little slower. It has bigger flowers. Uh, the unicum is the orange um, uh, dendrobium, usually quite often pendant. Uh, people stake it, but but the flowers sort of are, are all over the place and they reflex back. Uh, but it's it's also in this orange inside, so you have lots of the, the unicum in there. It does produce orange to, to yellow flowers with with uh, but the lip is is actually from the unicum because it has that uh, uh, markings uh, but you Unicum also will produce pink flowers. This rainbow dance is a great dendrobium to grow. You can see the patterning from the unicum, but obviously the the other parent um, has uh, really taken out the orange and it's now pink, but it flowers very easily. It really doesn't require much of a cooling uh, time and it will, I've seen it flower more than once a year. This is, this is a really nice dendrobium to, to grow. Um, and Sinia, of course, does a, a terrific job on this.
Another one of Sinia's dendrobiums, another nobly. It's a beautiful white uh, spring dream, a, uh, a pollen, HCCAOS. And uh, she winters it in the south window and five TZ, um, uh, T5s. Uh, I always love white flowers, and this particular one is so pristine. It's just gorgeous. And I bet it also has a, a very nice scent. And now we're back on to uh, Cymbidae and Catacidinae. Uh, and uh, this is the season for Cymbidium garingii to, to bloom. Uh, Michael Wang and, Ta and Taras Kowalczyk uh, grow these plants as a, as a team effort. One has conditions for this uh, uh, summer, one has conditions for the winter. So they, they team up and that's the way they do it. Um, and they they are very difficult to grow and to, uh, to bring up the flowers is even more difficult. So they really do a great job. Uh, now it looks like uh, Taras grew this one himself by himself. And it's, um, it's one that, that uh, it, it's probably the, the one that's most common. You, you see it in, in most often the green floor, uh, form, the color forms are, are are more rare and this looks like it might be one that has a little bit of variegation in the in the leaves. Uh, Garingia uh, Tama no Uoibi and uh, this is a uh, Michael and Tata's uh, collaboration and they you notice again it's the color. Uh, uh, for me the the use of of, um, uh, of chopsticks as as supports for these is a little bit much, but I guess they, they need that just to, to uh, this is at least the same color as, as the stem. Um, the, there is many, many different varieties of the Garingii um, and they're named for, for particular traits. And we can go on and on and on forever to, to if we were to know all of that there is to know about these. It's good that there are people who, who actually get into it and, and keep the knowledge going. Cymbidium green apple grown by Albert uh, Saint-Pierre. Uh, they grow in, it's a cold, in a cold room rather than in, in their greenhouse because you notice that they, their, their vandas and uh, oncidiums and things were growing in a, in a greenhouse. Uh, a nice uh, miniature cymbidium, uh, very clean flowers, clean color, uh, nice to have. Now we're to the miscellaneous. Inga and Peter grew this uh, Harrisonii. This is really well flowered. Look at all the flowers all the way around. Um, Inga says that uh, the fragrance is heady, but she would have expected uh, a darker flower. Now, I always think of Bifinaria Harrisonii as being a cream colored flower with a fairly dark uh, lip, but I did look up other uh, plants to see what Inga might be accepted. But I thought, um, and having lo looked them up, I realized that they really do vary a lot in color. But as far as I'm concerned, I think this lip is just gorgeous. Uh, the um, the flower could be a little bit more open, but I like the the, the fl little bit of flush of on the on the petals and and the uh, or on the sepals, I guess, and the white petals. But this lip is just to die for. It's great. Uh, it's not. I wouldn't put it on the sale table. I'd keep it, Inga. Chysis lemingii. This is a, a, another one of the, the, well, it's not a catacetinae really, um, but it, it, it is deciduous. It loses its leaves, but it's a very warm, again, it's a very warm grower, produces these wonderful flowers. And they, they um, actually had one in the, one of the classes that I judged for the WOC. And these were actually brilliant. The sepals and petals were actually brilliant orange. So th this is a very interesting and nice plant and it, it's not too big. Uh, this is a Cilogeny pandurata. Uh, the tag says uh, Asperata and, and actually as it turns out, Rob got this plant from us as Asperata. The Asperata is a, is a cream colored flower, smaller than this one. Again, produces lots of flowers and they're but this one is definitely not Asperata, it's Pandurata, uh, but the green uh, flowers are so so indicative of, of the species. And the really neat thing, is, as Rob has found out, is that 
that the 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 plant when happy uh, just keeps producing new growths and as the new growth starts the 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 uh, growth is sort of partially developed and then it puts out a spike and uh, you get this cascade of beautiful flowers and the uh, new growths come randomly so they can be in flower for a very long time another psilogeny uh, uh, xerichis and this has that really dark lip really pretty thing uh, you notice the way it's it's uh, uh, photographed from the bottom up that's exactly what needs to be done because these are mostly nodding flowers now xerichis can actually be a much more orange in color um, and, but it is a very nice cross. The plants aren't too big and the, the, the flowers are really pretty. This slip I think is, is, is really great. Uh, okay, now a Maxillaria tenifolia grown by Sylvie Porter. You have a really nice plant here, and I'm sure that the the fragrance from these fl all these flowers are are really heady because the the coconut smell is so great. Uh, one of the things to remember about tenifolia, if you got one that flowers, make sure you keep it because there are we had clones that grow, grew up to be huge big plants, and they would stingily once in a while give us a single flower. Um, it really you might as well grow grass if you're going to grow those clones but this is a nice one to grow and it's got pretty good color and a, and a, and as i say wonderful wonderful shape you notice that this is a different way of growing in these you have these uh it does a lot of climbing so some people actually put a uh like a a, a piece of uh tree fern or or uh, uh cork behind it so that the plant can climb up uh up a, a stand but they're not a, a, a neat growing plant but when they bloom boy they're worth having uh, the plurithal okay this is plurithalis by valvis hill island ccmaos grown by uh, joyce medcalf uh, and she says it blooms faithfully from february uh, to mid-may um, and we've seen this in in shows we've seen um, uh, we've I think it's even gotten a, a, a cultural award at some point. Uh, this is a beautiful thing. And look at the, uh, you know, this has a lot of little flowers, but look at the, the focus. You can see every flower, the leaves are in focus, the flowers are in focus. Very good photograph. This is what we're all aiming for. And this is another Floristalis, uh, Canalingura, uh, Fenwick Joy, CBR, CCM, AOS. Now, th this is special for, for Joyce and for all of us because it's one of uh, Mario's awarded plants. It's funny, we sold an awful lot of, of uh, Mario's awarded plants into the orchid community, but we don't see a lot of them. So it's always nice to, when one comes up on, on our show table. Well done, Joyce. Uh, I love this one. Um, of course, I, I like all of these uh, Pleurothalas that have these these uh, sort of heart-shaped leaves, um, and the um, uh, but I, and and what makes this even better is that it has these red flowers, erythrium, um, has the red flowers. There's there's a bunch of them have red flowers, but this these flowers are quite big. And what I didn't mention on the other two Pleurothalids. Uh, Pleurothallis is that you notice that these bloom on the old leaves and they can have more than one flower on each leaf. So really they're very, you know, when they flower, they're very, very rewarding. Nicely done. This I'd like to see a judging too. Okay, now for displays. And I'm always glad to see that people are trying to do some displays. Uh, the first one is, is one by uh, Michael and, and Taras. And this is uh, Geringii. Um, one thing, if you're going to uh, do a display, the display has a certain um, area. And if you're going to photograph it, then you need to photograph the whole thing. What I see here is only a partial uh, display. Um, and if this was taken from a little further back, we'd probably get a better proportion of, of uh, a sort of... Um, would see the, a better proportion of the of the plant to the background. Now I find it very, um, I don't find it much of a display because it's just two plants sitting side by side basically. So if you're going to do a, take a picture of your display, make make the picture 
encompass all of the, the, the display. That's a very important thing. Yes, the plants are going to look small and the, the flowers are going to look small, but now you're looking not on the individual flowers, you're looking at the total picture. So it's the total picture that we want to see. Um, here, it's a little bit better. Um, you see the whole plant and you see th that part of the display of these uh, uh, of these um, Geringiais, the, these Chinese cymbidiums, are the pot and the, the stand that they're on. And these are all very important and they have significance and they have to be so perfect. And of course, the screens that, that are on the back. So by taking the picture of the whole thing, now we can see what uh, a display. Nicely done. Um, now this uh, I thought was an interesting uh, picture that Elena gave, and this was, I guess, uh, showing you know that her students really <laughs> appreciate her and her her uh, her hobby, um, and this could easily be a really stunning display. You have uh, you, you look what you what you have. You have an orange flower, two pink ones, a yellow and pink flower and maybe lighter yellow pink flower and white flower. So if it was, if I was going to, first of all, when you look at this, um, these, the pots are actually quite prominent. So if you took a different angle, uh, maybe from up higher, they wouldn't be as, as, as prominent. But if I had these beautiful plants, they're so beautifully, uh, uh, flowered, what I would do is I would make this orange one because it's so different. I would make this my focus. Remember we talked about focus before and maybe put it nah, maybe over in here or something. Then because these uh, these uh, plants here have a little bit of the orange, a little bit of the pink, I would probably group them as sort of a, a frame for that orange. And then where where this, where I put this one, maybe add the pinks along here. So you'd have this gradation of color, then you're not, your eye isn't going from one to the other. It can flow from the orange to the um, orange, yellow, pink to the pink. So that it sort of calms things down and then you can really get the, the full effect of, of these beautiful flowers. Um, this is nicely done. I, I like this. The only thing I would say here is that you, uh, again, step back and get all the flowers. How come you cut these flowers off and these flowers off? They want to be in the picture too. So just step back and make sure that your, your lens actually uh, takes in the, the whole picture. If you, when you're taking the picture, then, uh, and you step back and you've got extra at the top, you can always crop it but make sure that you don't cut off your, the part of your display because obviously there's a lot of flowers in here and you want them as part of your display. I'm glad you're trying the, the, the displays because that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a big part of growing orchids. And then we come to the plant of the month. I have to congratulate Andrew on this because I thought the only person that could grow this was John Doherty. Um, he, uh, he, uh, he actually sold me a, a one of these and I grew it and I, it actually has this big fat, um, leaf and I grew that one year and the next year I actually got a flower stem and I've never seen flowers like this. So, um, is Andrew in the group? Could you turn on your microphone and tell us how, how you grow this? Andrew? Are you there? Andrew Shy. I thought I saw him on, on online. Um, but it is, this is a gorgeous thing. This is very difficult to grow because it goes dormant. And you know, when things go, when it goes dormant, it's like your, your sips. They, it, everything is happening is underground. So you really have to, um, uh, so Leslie's looking for 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 Andrew, um, but we've, I'd really like to, to hear how it grows because this is a challenge and a, and a challenge that when it's met this well, we really need to hear about it. Anyways, that, so that's our our uh, 
show table for today. And thank you for all the people that that contributed. Uh, Kathy tells me the 30 people. We had about 90 slides. So that is quite a, a uh, mouthful. Um, and thank you for this month's judge. Actually, I must say this this month we had uh, a pair of judges. There were it was a team, and you both did a, a great job. Thank you, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, and if you want to get, oh, okay. And so uh, Tyler tells me he's no, uh, he's no longer there. Oh, he's <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, so, and if you want to learn more about judging, and now the, the, what we're doing here is what we call ribbon judging, but if you want to get more into the, you know, you see that uh, AMAOS, uh, HCCAOS, to learn how, how we get to those designations, uh, you can join us, and you can start by joining us uh, for the, the in um, virtual education that's being carried on now, and once you've, you've got through some of that, um, then when we come to do uh, real judging, you, you'll, you'll feel much more confident. Okay, so now this is something that uh, we've had a very long meeting. I'm not going to go through this, uh, and, and I think we're going to put it in the, in, the, uh, um, in the newsletter, but take a look at these tips for, um, for, for good photography. And one of the things that I actually didn't think about was uh, that I would like to point out is to clean the lens, the camera lens for crisp resolution. Most of us are now doing our, our photography with our phones. Our phones go into our, our pockets, they go into our, um, into our purses, they have put down other places. And it's very easy for, for that, that uh, lens to get, to get mucked up. So make sure you clean your, your camera lens for, so you get that really good uh, resolution. But anyways, these, are, uh, these will be published. Take a look at them, consider them, and try to put it into your, into your, um, into your photography. Now, this is something special. As I said, we did uh, virtual judging for the uh, WOC uh, last week, I guess it was. Um, and this was uh, the grand champion. Um, and it is actually a Vol Volcare Tara. It's a Volcotara, which is a with uh, because it has Bretonia, Cattleya, Guaranthi, and Rincolalia uh, in the background. Uh, a beautiful thing. But now we look at photography, right? Beautiful background. But look at the t the the clips that they use to stake the plants. Blue clips. These are not, they do not add anything. And I must say some of the stuff that I uh, uh, um, judged was even worse in that they had orange clips on pink flowered uh, orchids and they used colored wire to, to, uh, to, to lasso the, 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 the uh, growths together. But this one, but it, certainly the flowers are, are just tremendous on this. Uh, this is the best cat layer, uh, uh, and again, um, for this is the way the photograph was taken because when we were judging, all the plants were taken, uh, uh, you know, at 90 degrees, sort of, to, to, you know, straight on. But in order for the best photograph of these flowers, uh, uh, tipping the pot by, you know, a few degrees would let you see all the, the, the head of flowers on the top. This was a very nice uh, plant. Now here, look at the staking here. You can't even see it. And that's really, really nice. So this was the best path. Beautiful thing. Um, what they did actually, they had these photographs. The, the, this is the photograph that we had. And then they were on some sort of turntables. So we could download these these. Um, uh, pictures, and then we could turn them around and enlarge them and, and look at them uh, more closely that way. But it took a lot of time. And this is your best uh, Philanopsis. Again, um, when we looked at this uh, for judging, uh, we could turn it around. So we actually saw the front. It's too bad that the plant, the a photograph that they presented as the photograph for the plant didn't give full credit to this, the, the full uh, beautiful arrangement. But I, I think I counted like 20 flowers on this and then it has all these buds coming. This was absolutely gorgeous. 
So that's the results of the virtual judging from the um, uh, from the WOC, the World Orchid Conference. Um, and this is the best dendrobium. Uh, it had, I don't know how many flowers, they didn't actually say how many flowers the, these things had. Uh, there was very little information. We just had to judge pictures basically. And then we have our orchid chuckles. Uh, okay, so we have this poor little growth. This is one of John Vermeer's uh, plants. Um, it put out a little growth, it's like two inches, and my goodness, it's still trying to put out a bud. These plants start, try so hard for us. Now, this is the, remember we talked about, those of you who are on early talked about the flower bud that, that finally opened. Well, this opened up, um, I think it was actually quite blue, had a lot of blue in it. Um, and it did open up this morning, but of course it was, a. Uh, um, it didn't quite make it for the show table. So he thought it was a little bit of a chuckle, but it did open up this morning so, so he could let us see what it was. Uh, now growing areas, uh, I'm not sure we have one dead cot grows in the ebb and flow tank for his fra frags. Um, is Ed still on? Can anybody tell? I didn't see for Ed, Ed on the uh, program. But anyways, basically what it is, is Ed there? No, Ed? Okay, so basically what happens is that there is a, um, uh, a tray here in, the t in this top shelf, uh, and this is a, a water a holding tank. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, in the, uh, I didn't, see, I will look for Ed before and I didn't see him on. Uh, so what happens is that there, there's a, a tray up here and there's a water tank down here. And on a timer, water is pumped into the tank. So, or uh, into the tray and it fills up to, uh, it's probably about four inches, I think four or five inches. And it fills that up and it stays for, for a, a, a lot of a, a amount of time then it drains back into the tank down here. And because uh, frags go in, air, uh, in places where actually water flows over their roots all the time, this works very well for, for, for frags, uh, for most of the frags. Now the caudatum types, it does not work for them because they grow much drier than, than uh, your Bessiers and your Favaccia and, and Longifoliums and things like that. So, but this is a, a way of, of uh, controlling water. Um, it it re does require some setup, but it does work very well. Evan, what was that, John? I, I, didn't, I, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, um, I'm just saying that Evan flow is not recommended for plants that might have virus. That that is true. Uh, you you don't often see virus in in frags, so this is the way they can do it. But anything that uh, the thing is that any sort of a disease, any kind of a problem you have with one plant, you can easily spread it to all of them that are in that ebb and flow. So that is an, an issue, and all an issue that you have to be quite aware of and and be very careful of. But for some things, it works very well. There are some people who grow dices like that. But it's um, um, it's something that it's something to consider, and it works for some people. We'd, and it's always nice to see how people uh, grow. And with that, I think we're done. Now I have uh, something for each one of you to do. Every one of you who are pay taking plants out for the summer, after we finish this, uh, we sign off here. I want you to go out and take a picture of the area where you're going to be putting your plants. Then you'll be all set for the before picture for uh, for for the summer uh, for Summerfest. Okay, so you've got a, you've got homework this time. So thank you for coming, and that's it for me. Oh, and by the way, uh, people who ordered plants from uh, Plant Paradise, you will be they're supposed to be coming the end of the month, so you'll be hearing from me uh, probably the last week in May. And that's it for me. Back to you, John.